You all want to know what my favorite religious holiday is? It occurs every spring and it's not Easter. Nor is it Passover. Pentecost. How do you celebrate Pentecost? The odds are you probably don't celebrate it, right? Or even know a whole lot about it, other than maybe that's when the tongues of fire first appeared over the apostles. And you're right, that did occur. But this day meant so much more to the early church than just that spectacle. For them, it was a day that celebrated liberation. In a sense, it was, it was their Independence Day. Let me explain. Pentecost is actually a Jewish holiday known as Shavuot, also known as the Feast of the Weeks. Occurring in the spring, 50 days after Passover, the feast commemorates the gift of the law by God bestowed upon Moses and his fellow Israelites as a guide for living. This is what Jesus' apostles were celebrating privately in an upper room when they, had a, when they had a supernatural experience of the Spirit of God in their midst. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as a fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. And then someone shouted, it's five o'clock somewhere, right? <laughs> That's just kidding. You know, during COVID, it's always five o'clock, right? No? Well, I got a problem. Pentecost is often taught as the reversal of the Genesis 11 story of the Tower of Babel. In that account, all the people of the world, speaking the same language, came together in order to build a tower so that they can make a name for themselves. Since naming rights is considered a sign of power, it's often interpreted as people wanting to become their own gods. As a result, God scatters the people all over the earth and confuses their language. The Greek word for sin means alienation or separation. The opposite of sin would therefore be what? Communion, right? The fact that at Babel the world is separated means that the people were sinning. They were kicking God out of their lives and the result was chaos. At Pentecost, the apostles were gathered together in a room to worship God, to praise God for God's guidance for them. The result? Union, understanding, which is the opposite of separation, right? It was while partaking in this Jewish feast day, the apostles realized that Christ was still with them in the form of the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised that after he left, God would send a paraclete, an advocate, and, and this is it. And at that moment, they were no longer separate and afraid. Barriers collapsed with most noticeably the language barrier being broken. They understood each other's differences and were united in the spirit of Christ. From there, they were empowered to leave the upper room, go out, and begin the church. This is why Christians regard Pentecost often as the unofficial birthday of the church. The Holy Spirit remains the most misunderstood person of the Trinity due to its abstract nature and the fact that it was the last to be revealed in Scripture. The Spirit is usually best described through the use of symbolism, dove, bones, wind, etc. The Hebrew word for spirit is ruah, literally meaning wind or breath. Therefore, it's the force of God that's all around us and drives us. Like wind, although we may not be able to see it, we can certainly feel its effects. Like breath, we need it to survive. At Pentecost, the apostles experienced this euphoria of the spirits and were compelled to begin the church. Over the next few decades, questions over what will drive this new church, the Law of Moses, aka the Torah, or the Holy Spirit, will unfold as the first theoethical debate of Christianity. The issue specifically surrounded if whether or not a Gentile would need to first become a Jew in order to become a Christian. In other words, would they have to follow the kosher dietary restrictions, and if male, partake in the ritual mandate of circumcision? For observant Jews, it was seen as a grave offense to even be in the presence of a Gentile, let alone eat with them. For being a Gentile was seen as the same as being a sinner, since they did not follow the laws and were by definition unclean, polluted, and idolatrous. 
This would certainly make Eucharistic celebrations difficult since eating a large meal together was a pivotal part of early Christian worship. They didn't start just using bread and wine until they got cheap. Because of this debate, Gentiles would first need to repent of being a Gentile and then adopt the purifying and transforming practices of God's covenantal people, the Jews, before they could become Christians. Now, does this sound familiar to you? Because this is ultimately a question of who is permitted to receive communion in today's Roman Catholic Church, right? The call to circumcise is arguably the first divine command given to God's people. In Genesis 17, it's intended to serve as a sign of the covenant and is mentioned no less than 30 times in the Hebrew scriptures. Even Jesus and his apostles were circumcised. So certainly one could make the case that this external mark ought to remain a prerequisite for the faith, right? This still remains a heated topic today, particularly in the United States, the only industrialized nation that circumcises its males for non-religious reasons. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kellogg. I'm never going to eat cornflakes again. And for queer people, circumcision as a religious ritual carries with it some additional baggage. Why does it matter to you if Gus is circumcised? It matters that he's been in this world less than a week, and already there are people who won't accept him for the way he is, who'd even mutilate him rather than let him be the way he is, the way he was born. Well, I'm not going to let that happen. Circumcision is also known to decrease sexual pleasure for both the man and his partner, which would make this first century theological debate also a sexual ethics one. Not to mention the questionable morality of mutilating one's genitals without one's consent. In some countries, circumcision's illegal. So the first century church met its first division with people taking sides or factions as St. Paul would refer to them. On the right, the pro-law slash circ side was headed by James, known as the brother of Jesus, who served the role of bishop in Jerusalem. He apparently was the guy you had to convince. On the left, the anti circ side was headed by Paul, a former Pharisaic Jew and persecutor of Christians. And in the middle was Peter, who flip-flopped depending on who he was around. Oh, Peter, he's literally my favorite person in the New Testament. The final decision was made at the Council of Jerusalem in 50 AD when James announced that the Jewish law would no longer be required, dropping the circumcision mandate and the kosher dietary restrictions, with the exception of eating meat that was sacrificed to an idol. So in other words, the laws of purity would no longer be the driving force of this new church. Now, how did they reach that decision? How did they flippantly dismiss 30 mentions of circumcision in the Old Testament and what, and what was the first divine command of the Abrahamic covenant? How? Because the Holy Spirit guided their conscience. For Peter, the story of his change of heart is well documented in Acts chapter 10, where his experience with Cornelius led him to realize that even Gentiles received God's Spirit. Peter questioned, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? and ordered the baptism of all God-fearing Christians. Unfortunately, he didn't stay true to Cornelius, finding himself resorting back to profaning what God had made clean. You know, deeply rooted prejudices are often hard to break, right? A fact that Paul calls him out on in Galatians chapter 2. Paul's decision to include Gentiles is just as remarkable and radical as his conversion to the Christian faith was. Once a Pharisaic Jew and persecutor of the Christian movement for what he believed were grave violations of traditional Jewish laws, Paul became the foremost advocate of faith as the basis for salvation. Not works, not the law. As a Pharisee, the law was the end-all be-all. It was his identity. It was his drive. It was the reason why he persecuted the Christians. For him to abandon it is, is just shocking, but speaks volumes of the influence the Holy Spirit had on his life. Pre-conversion, Paul was kind of like a religious fundamentalist with that zeal he had in persecuting others, his refusal to see them as whole persons due to his unquestioning support for religion, the temple, its clergy, as well as his obsessive need for validation from the external law. But ultimately, and this is what's important, it was a relationship with the risen Christ through the Holy Spirit that changed those views. He eventually went on to compare that law to slavery and preach that following the Holy Spirit is 
liberation. The scales fell from his eyes and he could finally see. The same hope that we share for all of those people who persecute us. The Holy Spirit must have also been working through Apostle James, whose change of heart isn't documented in the scriptures. And this goes to show that even the most conservative among the group can become more progressive with the help of the Spirit. The Spirit blows where it blows. It cannot be contained. The purity system was an abstract way of indicating what fits, what is appropriate, and what is in place. Recall Leviticus. It was a system designed to peg, classify, and structure the world. By eliminating the external laws of the system, the Holy Spirit has no bounds. Categories no longer matter in this new church. Just love. Of course, this vision of the church doesn't last beyond the first 100 years or so. Listening to the Spirit rather than an external authority is just unsustainable from a management perspective. People want rules. There's comfort in the black and white. Oh well. Over the course of the next 2,000 years, the Catholic Church develops a rather rich theology on the relationship between the Holy Spirit and the human conscience, and the role it should play in moral decision making. What's most interesting to me is that despite the rule-driven reputation of the Roman Catholic Church, when you're in a position of conflict between established church teaching and one's individually well-developed conscience, they teach that you have a moral imperative to follow your own conscience. With Thomas Aquinas even acknowledging that it is better to die in excommunication from the church than to violate your conscience. This is known in Catholic moral theology as the primacy of conscience. The Holy Spirit speaks to every one of us equally. God guides each one of us equally. And therefore, it would be a sin to ignore that guidance, to ignore that voice. John Henry Newman writes, Conscience is the aboriginal vicar of Christ. In other words, the original stand-in for Christ. And that when there is a conflict between conscience and church teaching, in order to prevail against the voice of the Pope, one must follow upon serious thought, prayer, and all available means of arriving at a right judgment on the matter in question. Let me be clear. The primacy of conscience is not a free pass to do whatever sin you'd like. Your conscience must be seriously well-developed for you to go against the church in matters of morality. This includes prayer, research, alternatives, advice, the list goes on. The Roman Catholic Catechism contains 27 paragraphs reiterating this idea that conscience is primary and that it would be sinful to go against it. There was actually a Jesuit school in Indianapolis that recently used this church teaching in order to refuse a bishop's order to fire one of their teachers for being gay. The school officials cited that it's their moral obligation to follow one's conscience. God, I love the Jesuits. And since there's only two paragraphs in the catechism that's against homosexuality, I'll say that the odds in the, are in the school's favor that they're making the right call. But how do you know that it's the spirit acting in your life and not, say, some evil demon whispering crazy thoughts into your head? Well, Jesus says you'll be able to tell them by their fruits. St. Irenaeus of Lyons wrote, The glory of God gives life. Mother Teresa said, Where there is love, there is God. The late Jesuit John McNeil said that we can legitimately evaluate the validity of a religious belief system by its psychological consequences. And St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, taught a lot on how to properly discern the spirit. Discernment is defined as the spiritual interpretation and evaluation of feelings and the direction in which we are moved by them. During his personal conversion experience, when thinking about emulating his life off the saints, Ignatius felt a sense of inner peace. When he thought about doing more worldly things, like impressing a certain lady, he felt dry. Slowly, Ignatius came to see that this is one way that God leads us. He realized that if you act in accordance with God's desires for you, you will naturally feel a sense of peace, what Ignatius calls consolation. Feelings of joy, tranquility, and increase in hope, faith, and charity, causing a soul to be inflamed with love. It's an indication that you're on the right path. Conversely, feelings of desolation, turmoil within, agitations, temptations, tepidness, unhappiness, hopelessness, signal that you're on the wrong path. 
In short, all you have to do is look at the actions and effects of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Look at that inspiration that drove the early church to go out and be Christ in the world. If you find that you have similar feelings within yourself, that's when you know the Holy Spirit is alive and active in your life and in your moral decision making. And for me, everything in my spiritual, professional, theological, scriptural, rational, and experiential background has brought me to the consolation that being gay is not a sin but a clear representation of the image of God. At Pentecost, Peter acknowledged that God pours out God's spirit upon all flesh, men, women, young, old, slaves, and free, who shall prophesy, see visions, and dream dreams. The Holy Spirit draws each of us to hear and understand the good news in our native tongues, our own languages. We must recognize that the gospel and its interpretation isn't the exclusive property of heterosexual, cisgendered male clerics. I said it before and I'll say it again. I believe that queer people of faith can be at the forefront of a new understanding of how the divine works. Undoubtedly, people will snare at us as they did the first disciples. They will accuse us of being drunk or crazy or demon-possessed, or sexually addicted blasphemers, heretics and perverts, but the opportunity is before us to change the world by our testimony, by our example, and by our embrace of the Spirit. And what better way to get started than by throwing a massive Pentecost party? Woo!